Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, workshop, Specialized Topics in Wind Power Generation 2021. And okay, let's start. We will start uh, this uh, week two, uh, second day with uh, Dr. Miguel Robles. Uh, the talk, as you may read, is Machine Learning Methods on the Study of Dynamic of Winds of Wind. Uh, I will give you a short uh, introduction of uh, Miguel, Miguel Robles. Dr. Miguel Robles is a physicist, graduated from the Faculty of Science of UNAM. He has uh, a master in solar energy and uh, a PhD sciences uh, by the University of the States of Morelos. His research interests are statistical physics, computational physics, liquid theory, materials science, complex systems, and data science. So we are very happy having you here, Miguel. Welcome. And the flat is yours. OK, thank you. Can you listen to me? Yes. OK, so everything is working. Thank you very much, Osvaldo. And thank you for the invitation to be here. It's, it's a joy to see known faces, uh, unless we are in Zoom, but it's very nice to be here. Uh, the talk that I am thinking to give, is, give you today is related with the work we have been doing for the last four or five years. Uh, but it's mainly a contribution of uh, undergraduate and graduate students of, of, the, of our institute. So it's a fantastic team that has been collaborating with me in, in these topics that uh, <clears throat> at the beginning, we, th we think that uh, it would be uh, uh, incorporating Machine learning, novel methods to the study of wind. Nowadays, uh, you can see in my title that I am resuming this in this way, machine learning methods. But, but perhaps I should uh, start changing this because I am not sure now that it's only machine learning. And perhaps we should say data science methods or perhaps we can we can say complex complex system methods. I am not sure how to say, it, but in the course of the speak, maybe you can uh, uh, give me an opinion on that. But the fact is that uh, what I want to share today is related with these uh, five points. The first is one idea that all of you, I'm sure. Have uh, have acquired during during your studies in energy and, and renewable energies. Wind is a complex system, so it's very complex. Wind is complex; it's a constant that all we have. So it's complex to understand and it's complex to 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 have a complete view of how how to use it. Uh, and then we have to treat in this way considering always like a complex system. The second concept that I, I want to use is, a, is uh, the concept of wind states. It's something that we have used the, uh, for some years here in the group uh, to il illustrate a way of analyze the wind, the wind uh, let's say the dynamics. And, related with some of these uh, machine learning methods like, like, like clustering. That was the beginning of our job and it has been giving new routes of research. And I want to introduce it and give uh, uh, more or less uh, a clear idea and view for all of you in order to, to settle a base to, on the, to have the same understanding of, of things. The third point, is a work that uh, we have been exploring in the past, let's say, two years, uh, trying to relate some of these wind state concepts and machine learning concepts to the computer fluid dynamics simulations. 
uh, because some of the results are difficult to interpret from a physical point of view and simulations always can give clear what is going on inside. We have tried to do this in, uh, in, in, in during the pan this pandemic, unless we haven't advanced much because all the problems we have been ha having. The third point that I want to, to address is how the network science is always playing a role or can, or can also play a, a role, an important role on the research of the wind dynamics. And at the end, I want to try to uh, introduce also a, another concept that uh, doesn't yet have a name, I would say. We are trying to, to, to create and we are uh, perhaps saying, naming large scale states or perhaps wind electric demand states. When we coupling a generalization of these wind states with other variables or other indicators that could be electric, electric, ele electric indicators or social indicators or economic indicators. Uh, so this is uh, something new that we are also trying to start working recently. So let's begin with the first wind is complex. Of course, all of you know all these kind of maps. And here, even though it looks simple because the map is, let's say, is a beautiful picture, uh, clearly say that the wind in Earth is a very complex system where the influence of many things like the orography, the temperature, the the sea currents, everything is influencing uh, all these patterns of wind inside the atmosphere. But this is not the only thing because this is one point of view at very large scale. But uh, in, in, in the reality, when we want to use the, the wind, we use it in very small scale portions of this map. So, and we, when we say very small portions, it's really small compared with this size. So scales are very important. All of you, I'm sure, are dealing with these issues. And then one of the challenges to understand uh, the wind dynamics uh, faces the, the, the challenge of how to make compatible results that we can work in very small scales and results that we work in large scales. So, and is not only in, in length scales, all, all, also in time scales. So it resembles a lot of what we have in, in the study of material sciences when we deal with macroscopic uh, measures and mi mi microscopic and macroscopic and microscopic uh, variables and we try to relate through different theories or, or different levels of comprehension. When we, when we deal with data, we are used to, used to have this kind of results. And this kind of results come from the weather station data. And all the time we are analyzing this and it's clearly how it's a very complex uh, result or measures that we have. Even though we are dealing with a system that is large scale. So it's very strange all the time we have this data and we face the comprehension of, or of a very large scale system. In fact, this data, the same data can be presented in different ways and we use it in different ways. We can use it these histograms that like we, have, we can see here. We can deal with time series here and, or we can deal even with the more, more detailed 
uh, structures like the velocity vector taking in account direction and velocity. Uh, <clears throat> one of the ideas that we, we had some years ago was to start working with this time series. This is a time series, but this is a series that is uh, composed by vectors instead or of scalars. That is the difference. Every point in this, in this place represents a vector instead of, of a scalar. And the interesting thing is that when we analyze wind, we can see uh, we can see an stochastic process, but not so much stochastic, let's say. There are regularities because as we can see further, this can be uh, defined like a game, a simple game, like a random walk. Imagine that I, I draw the velocity, the velocity, oh, sorry. Oh, again, the technology, sorry. Okay, we can see that this could be defined like a random walk, something like this. But this is a random walk that never leaves specific regions I'm going to try to play again. So we can see two regions and we can see that the random walk never escapes. Or we can even try to, if, if the velocity vectors would be the step of a random walk, we, can, we could see that the walker is always in one direction or mainly in one direction, no, it's not so random. So these games that can be used for modeling wind are simple models, even though they have a very complex uh, definition. And the idea be behind, behind the, the concept of wind states is this complexity here that we have in this vector, vector field uh, space. Because if we plot it all together, we could see that we can recognize first that is very restricted or very restricted to a place. So velocities never go out of this space. But when we see, for example, the frequency where the points lie, we could see patterns like those one. And here are preferred regions with a very structured way. And then it's like a shadow of something that could be physical or have some physical meaning. If this were uh, the phase space of a material or, or a, ga a gas or something, we would say that this structure could lead us to think in microscopic states. So that's the reason why we can think that wind also forms states represented by these cumulus, these clusters of points. And they distribute in a way that could be defined by a probability distribution function in such a way that the picture that the data give us is something like, the, like this one. We have then portions that we can be defined by very well-defined functions and superimposed one to the other. And let's say that it's possible that reality is in a superposition of different wind states. Every wind state could be estimated in some way if it, if it could exist. One way to do it 
or one, one way that we propose to do it is to make a clusterization of data, a classification. So a need reach here, a method of machine learning that is clustering. When we apply clustering to this data, we can find, we can find this kind of sets and we can relate these sets to the estimation of a function that at the end is, uh, is a Gaussian function because at least in this picture, what I am displaying here is an approximation using Gaussian functions. So those are functions that are exponential, more or less like this. in terms of two variables divided by this quantity. Where we use two quantities, one is the mean value and the other is the sigma that is the covariance matrix. Those functions describe here, what we can call a wind state. So that's the idea behind this concept. Data can be described by an analytical function, at least approximately, and then we can define it, uh, this region of space like a state, this region of the velocity space. So we have to be careful. Then the dynamics of the wind moves like a random walk in every of this space, for example, in one state, and suddenly it jumps to the other state. This is the dynamics what we are finding. And this is the dynamics that we have to model to understand wind at the end, or at least it's a path to understand. The interesting thing that is a path different from the traditional uh, fluid dynamics approach and could give uh, complementary information to that. But when we define in this way the analysis, there are a lot of questions that we can raise. Remember that I am uh, a theoretical physicist, so many things I can try to ask here. Does it have a physical reality or is simply a numerical trick? Those states are local or non-local. Remember that the data are very local, are coming from a weather station in a point situation, in a site. So those these states extend to different sites, are the same states, they change. The reality, this, this structure that we are finding that in principle could be regarded as time independently, are really time independently. Is it a new useful concept? Can be related with geographic and climate, climatic parameters? Can be modeled from hydrodynamic equations? So it can come from the hydrodynamic equation. How can we do that? So a lot of things we can rise a lot of questions we can rise from here. And we have decided, well, I have tried to at least start setting or, or, or exploring some of them. The first, uh, the first of them about the physical reality and let's say this one and perhaps this one, and even this one could be uh, at least approached to an understanding using uh, numerical simulations, using computer, computer fluid dynamics, computational fluid, fluid dynamics. Because if we study a, a, a system controlled, uh, simple, we can try to find a, a possible relation between the measures locally done and the whole view of a fluid. Since 
the, the problem is that it's not simple because we are dealing with, with a system that could have, for example, variable boundary conditions and let's say boundary condition varying in a Gaussian way. If we want to introduce this idea of Gaussian distribution in the velocities. So to explore this path, we have decided to, to set a, a toy model, a simple toy model in order to try to understand what is going on inside. To do that, to do that we have performed simulations using open form, well known, I think, for most of you. We decided to start using two dimensional simulations, obviously to reduce uh, the complexity of the problem. We have decided to set obstacles because obstacles are part of the nature of wind. In this case, we have set a square, square-like obstacles like you have, you are viewing in the picture. We have decided to try to explore how to deal with random velocity boundary conditions. Let's say wind coming in a specific direction with a specific intensity, but that can vary on direction and speed in a bivariate Gaussian with a bivariate Gaussian distribution. We are, we are, we try also to do it in a quasi static approach. And I am going to explain this in the next slide. And through the creation of an ensemble creation. In a statistical mechanics, this is very common because a study the dynamic of microscopic worlds is not that simple to analyze the time evolution. And sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, the creation of a collection of, of views of the system in different times and in this order can give us the same information of the time evolution. That's the concept of an ensemble. So what we have introduced is to try to create an ensemble from computer fluid dynamic simulations. More or less the, the scope is to create something like this a collection of different situations. Remember at the end, measures that we take in, in the weather stations are integrating time intervals on about 10 minutes. So it's possible that we are observing the system to develop, I wouldn't say to a stationary state, but to develop one specific situation they have time to do it, even though uh, it could be more complex than, than that. But what we are trying to recreate is that we are giving an input, simul an input velocity as a, as a boundary condition. We let the system to develop and we take a picture. Then we change the velocity for a second one with a statistical meaning. I mean, all of them are become from a Gaussian distribution and, and let develop. And then we, we can do a collection of a lot of pictures and then try to understand what's going, going on inside. In this situation, we can find different, uh, the obstacles can give us a variety of phenomena that are really complex there. Uh, we can we can see, for example, places where we can, where where vortices vortices can appear. It's not very clear here, but we we found some places where vortices appear. So this is there are regions where vortices appear. There are regions where we have very well defined streams and, and things like that. So we decided to apply a sensor here a virtual sensor, a theoretical sensor, in order to see how the velocity change or how the collection of velocities change. And the result is something like this. The input is a Gaussian distribution in the velocity field. The output 
depending is depending on the place where we where we measure but we can find that where we are close to this stream line so these streams we can find very well defined gaussians out states so they are not the same in the in a state they transform obviously but they preserve this gaussian gaussian shape here and here is clear in these two points in this point situated here where the turbulence and all these things can happen there because of the obstacles the gaussian is not necessary completely so may happen some something different as we can see here the statistics is not yet a, a clear a clear gaussian so <clears throat> it depends on the shape and the geometry of the environment how we can see these these uh, these distributions the interesting thing is that uh, weather stations used to measure uh, not in the not in the flat but at some height and that means that uh, is less sensitive to the to the roughness of the of the hurt and that means that possible is more common to, to measure all these kind of gaussian states is is easier to appear and that's why we then always to observe this effect and then it's not so strange to to try to think that uh, a uh, well-developed current and macroscopic, not macroscopic and macroscale current described with a Gaussian distribution would be measured in the weather station also like Gaussians, but perhaps a superposition of Gaussians because of the environment that is very close to them. But this, this is not the only thing we can measure because we can always try to find places where the maximum velocity can be reached, for example, here or around here. There are points where the velocity reaches a maximum, let's say a kind of hot spot where the wind resource could be also maximum. This is very important if we want to assess places where we can use uh, the, the wind energy for producing electricity, for example. And the interesting thing is that if we collect uh, this ensemble, we can define now regions of hot spots, not only a, a, a single point, but regions where we should uh, use the, the, the energy or we could use the energy to transform to electricity, for example. So what we can say this is that it seems that these ensemble collections can give, you, give us information. Of course, we can to <clears throat> try to see that compared to this with a real case, this is important. So it's something that is pending and is in processing at some moment. We could select a real place with real obstacles and try to find if this is possible to, to assess. Sorry. Then the next step is to deal <clears throat> with the locality, the issue of are those states local? What happens when we are sensing in different weather stations, but in a close region? For example, we found data in Zacatecas in Mexico. We have four stations separated of the order of 10 kilometers, enough of them, all of them uh, in, a, in an orographic common region. So, can we detect there 
states that we can define as regional states, that's another question. If we plot the maps of the velocity, this is the density maps of the velocity, those are in, a, in, in the different stations, we could see that the distribution, even though is similar, is also content, could contain huge differences. And the question here is, can we develop a method in order to try to find now this global, this let's say state, this regional state using these machine learning methods? Well, we try to do it. And we also apply it, these clustering methods in order to try to define the wind states and then try to find the correlation between them. Sorry, Miguel, but, to interrupt. We have a couple of minutes, please. Okay, yes, I'm going to close. The main issue is that these leads with our class, is not the problem now is a network because all the states, oh my God, all the states could be related with the others. So, and now raise a network problem that could be solved using community analysis is clustering in a network and using community and finding the common the common states we could oh, we could find oh sorry this kind of maps where the color represents the community and the funny thing is that the community could lead us a way to discover the common states automatically. That's another point. And to close the, the speech, I would say, what about the larger scales? We can go even further because now we have, for example, the, the data coming from the Atlas Eolic Me Mexicano, El Atlas Eolico Mexicano. There we, ha we have at least seven stations uh, in, the, in the whole country. And we can try to do more or less the same, but this is uh, every, every new station is more complex. And now the situation is, has been different. We try to evaluate, to discard some of them, evaluate which one of them really produce energy. So we are, can compute the, the, power, the power of the wind, the, 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 the factor, the plant factor of, of uh, an hypothetical generator, and we can select some of them and we can define, when we have seven, we can define wh how many of them are producing energy at some moment and then create a chain, more or less a Markov chain with this information that could be synchronized with the load of the network in order to evaluate at least qualitatively a state of positive or negative uh, uh, evaluation of wind in some moment. This idea we are working now, and I am going to the closing remarks. And uh, we think that could, be, could lead to, to new, open new lines in order to analyze large scales. At the end, the closing remarks are there, are there, you can say it. And I let uh, the speech here in order to open for some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel. We have time, yes, indeed, for a couple of questions. Uh, I, I'm reading one in the chat is from Oscar Martinez. And he's asking about how did you decide the location of the, ob of the obstacles? Uh, I think he's speaking about, I don't know if you want to open your microphone, uh, Oscar, and do it by yourself. Yes, yeah, I, I'm talking about the, um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so so when you were showing the, the CFD the simulations, the, you had some obstacles, but I missed, how do you decide to put uh, the location of those obstacles? Well, um, at the moment, uh, our initial idea was to try to, to think in in in, uh, in buildings, so that's the reason why we decided to be squares. We were not thinking exactly to think in in obstacles in nature, let's say. So we were thinking in cities. So okay, 
uh, and is perhaps our aim to go to to go to simulate more in cities, but but uh, is is more in a, in an abstract way. We have decided uh, the the geometry because of that. These are okay. buildings, and at the end we have put in a, in a, in a, with some symmetry symmetry, and that's all. No, we didn't. We didn't pay much attention on, on 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 the initial setup because we didn't know exactly what to expect. Okay, yeah, yeah, because the 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 distribution that you showed reminded me a lot of because we have been looking at at this at the data from from Chiapas and Oaxaca, and it reminded me a lot of 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 that uh, that bimodal or well almost my bimodal distribution and in with the, that sort of orientation. And for example, in that case, in the case of, of uh, Chiapas and, and Oaxaca, there is the, the, the big influence from the, from the and, and, and Osvaldo knows a, a lot about this, the, the, the mountain change, chains that uh, sort of create a, 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 a gap between the, the, the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific. Uh, yes. And, uh, so it reminded me of of, of that and, and also the, the the configuration that you were using. So it's it, it's 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 quite interesting. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, Oscar.